Okay, welcome back to Grocket on Grocket.com. This is the OG TV program where I, Jim Jacobson, the person mentioned in the upper right of your screen, will be going through with you and your official guide in front of you the questions in the official guide, the 12th edition to the guide, uh, question by question. <clears throat> when we left off last time, we were just about at the end of the critical reasoning section, and this time we are going to finish it off. We're going to do the last section of questions before we move on to sentence correction next time. So, um, we left off last time, we finished up with number 112 on page 520, and I am going to pick up with number 113 on page 520. So, that is page 520, question number 113. We're going to get through a little bit more this time, so I guess I might be talking a little bit faster, but we'll see. Uh, I'll just do the, see how it goes. Uh, as usual, I will be reading the questions, but not putting them on the screen for you, and you will be following along in your book. <clears throat> so, the pharmaceutical industry argues that because new drugs will not be developed unless heavy development costs can be recouped in later sales, the current 20 years of protection provided by patents should be extended in the case of newly developed drugs. However, in other industries, new product development continues despite high development costs a fact that indicates that the extension is unnecessary. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the pharmaceutical industry's argument against the challenge made above? Okay, so the argument against the challenge, weakening the challenge is the same thing often. I guess not always, but uh, weakening the challenge um, often uh, involves strengthening the original argument. Um, in any case, the challenge is that uh, 20 years is enough to make back development costs. So that's the argument that that is challenging the pharmaceutical company's argument um, and the pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmaceutical company's argument is that 20 years is not enough. Um, so we need to basically show that 20 years is not enough. Backing up the pharmaceutical companies claim that 20 years is not enough for them to make their money back. So we need to just look for that in the answer choices. <clears throat> Choice A, no industries other than the pharmaceutical industry have asked for an extension of the 20-year limit on patent protection. What other industries do is outside the scope of the passage. So, uh, you know, we can't really do anything about that or do anything with that. We need it to be related to the 20-year time period and how that affects the pharmaceutical industry in particular, so other industries are not relevant. Uh, choice B, clinical trials of new drugs which occur after the patent is granted and before the new one, um, before the new drug can be marketed, often now take as long as 10 years to complete. So... Uh, choice B is basically saying that they um, may only have 10 years to make their development money back because of this clinical drug, uh, clinical drug trial phase. So uh, this actually does weaken the claim that 20 years is enough time to make the, back the money. 20 years perhaps would be enough time to make, make the money back um, for pharmaceutical companies if they had 20 years. Choice B says that the 20 years is less than 20 because of the way their industry in particular works. So choice B actually uh, deals specifically with the time issue um, <clears throat> relevant in this argument. Let's look at the other ones though just to be sure. There are several industries in which the ratio of research and development costs to revenue um, or to revenues is higher than it is in the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, again, what other industries have is outside the scope. The only way that other industries would be relevant, I, I guess I don't want to give the impression that other industries would never be relevant. Um, it could perhaps strengthen or weaken something if it's made explicit that, um, I mean, it does depend on the argument, but if it's made explicit that these other industries have, have uh, work, work exactly the same way as the pharmaceutical industries do, um, you know, well, you know, this other industry has this problem. Um, so, for example, if Choice B had said in the, uh, I don't know, what would be a good example? In the food 
product industry, um, there's a there's a testing phase uh, like that in the clinical in the pharmaceutical industry that requires 10 years, you know, then another industry could be relevant, but um, only if it's tied directly to, directly back to the pharmaceutical industry. We didn't have that in choice C, so um, choice D, an existing patent for a drug does not legally prevent pharmaceutical companies from bringing to market alternative drugs, provided they are sufficiently dissimilar to the patented drug. Well, yeah, I guess that's nice to have a definition of the patent, but, um, you know, that yeah, they don't have to bring to market. They can bring to market alternative drugs, but the the point is about the uh, the patents and recouping the development costs on the ones that actually are patented. So alternative drugs, getting around that different issue. Uh, and then E, much recent industrial innovation has occurred in products, for example, in the computer and electronics industries, for which patent protection is often very ineffective. So the passage is not about industrial innovation. It is about uh, getting back your development costs. So this is also outside the scope, leaving us with choice B for number 113. Still page 520, number 114. So this is a guidebook writer speaking. I have visited hotels throughout the country and have noticed that in those built before 1930, the quality of the original carpentry work is generally superior to that in hotels built afterward. Clearly, carpenters working on hotels before 1930 typically worked with more skill, care, and effort than carpenters who have worked on hotels built subsequently. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the guidebook writer's argument? Um, the guidebook writer's argument being that carpenters after 1930 don't care as much. That's the conclusion. The evidence is that, um, I, I mean, again, this is the evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. I probably should have written that up there first. Okay, so the evidence is that um, hotels that are pre-1930 have better carpentry. And I suppose uh, carpenters after 1930 didn't care as much. They may not all still be alive. Anyway, so... Um, the assumption then clearly relates to um, the carpenters and the hotels, that basically um, the fact that the ones that this travel writer has seen have better carpentry is an indication of um, how much the carpenters cared. So we need to look for a relation, uh, some, and so we need to weaken this argument, we need to weaken the connection that um, the, the uh, hotels built before 1930, we need to weaken their better carpentry, the connection between their better carpentry and the carpenters caring. We need some other reason why there's better carpentry in the hotels built before 1930. Okay, so choice A, the quality of original carpentry in hotels is generally far superior to the quality of original carpentry in other structures, such as houses and stores. Quite possibly true, definitely, certainly, outside the scope. We don't care about other structures, we only care about carpenters and carpentry in hotels. Uh, choice B, hotels built since 1930 can generally accommodate more guests than those built before 1930. We don't care about guests. We care about carpentry, woodwork. Um, choice C, uh, the materials available to carpenters working before 1930 were not significantly different in quality from the materials available to carpenters working after 1930. So if anything, this would strengthen the travel writer's argument. If, if the materials, so one of the arguments for uh, the pre-1930 hotels being better, not relevant to how much the carpenters cared would have been, oh, well, the materials that they had access to, the wood was better, or they had sharper tools that were handmade. You know, those would have been things that uh, 
would have weakened his argument that it was the carpenter's care that resulted in the better woodwork. Um, however, um, that's not what it does. Uh, choice C actually strengthens the argument that, no, no, that wasn't a factor. They didn't have better stuff. They just cared more, so C strengthens, which is not what we need. Uh, D, the better the quality of original carpentry in a building, the less likely that building is to fall into disuse and be de demolished. So uh, choice D doesn't look that attractive when you first read it, perhaps, until you realize what it's doing. What it's doing is it says that um, there were hotels and all sorts of other buildings that had terrible carpentry where the carpenters didn't care. Those buildings no longer exist. So basically, um, the, uh, the ratio, the representative sample, however you want to think about it, the, ho the only hotels that are left are the ones that have good carpentry. It may be exactly the same percentage of hotels that have good carpentry versus bad carpentry pre-1930 and post-1930. It's just that all the ones, or most of the ones that are bad from uh, 1930 and before, no longer exist. They, they fell into disuse and were demolished. So uh, choice D says, no, no, carpenters care the same amount. It's just all the crappy ones went away. So D, pretty tempting, we'll, but we'll keep looking at E. Choice E, the average length of apprenticeship for carpenters has declined significantly since 1930. Length of apprenticeship, kind of the time trap, but really not, not exactly. But really, we need a reason other than carpenters care, um, or even knowledge, um, that the, uh, that there's so many more hotels built pre-1930 that have good carpentry. So choice E still doesn't do it. Choice D clearly um, clearly explains, gives us a reason other than the care of the carpenters um, that these older hotels have better carpentry. Again, there, were, there used to be other ones that had bad carpentry. Those have been demolished. Choice D for number 114. 521 is now the page, and 115 is now the question. I almost read the first word of 115 as carpenters, carpenters of all species. Haha, <laughs> okay. Uh, caterpillars of all species produce an identical hormone called juvenile hormone that maintains feeding behavior. Only when a caterpillar has grown to the right size for pupation to take place does a special enzyme halt the production of juvenile hormone. This enzyme can be synthesized and will, on being ingested by immature caterpillars, kill them by stopping them from feeding. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the view that it would not be advisable to try to eradicate agricultural pests that go through a caterpillar stage by spraying croplands with the enzyme mentioned above? Okay, so uh, this is one of those quote-unquote gift ones where they basically restate the argument in the question and give us a specific aspect of it, as opposed to just saying, you know, which of the following would um, weaken the plan above, you know. So they've restated for us, we need to um, weaken the idea that, hey, let's get rid of all caterpillar pests by spraying this thing that will cause them to starve themselves. Okay, so um, the enzyme kills all caterpillars. So, um, and we need to weaken the idea that, sp that spraying this on all crops is going to be a good idea to get rid of caterpillar agricultural pests. So why wouldn't we want to kill all the caterpillars? Is it A, most species of caterpillar are subject to some natural predation? Well, some natural predation means that some critters, like birds or other insects, are going to go and eat the caterpillars. But the idea is, by spraying this, that we get rid of all of them. So some natural predation doesn't really, it certainly doesn't weaken the idea. It just says that, hey, this spraying this enzyme will finish the job. Uh, choice B, many agricultural pests do not go through a caterpillar stage. This question was specifically about agricultural pests that go through a, a caterpillar stage. So the ones that don't, obviously, they have to do something else for, clearly outside the scope. Uh, choice C, many agriculturally beneficial insects go through a caterpillar stage. So 
and many agriculturally beneficial insects. So this enzyme kills all caterpillars by forcing them to starve themselves when they are in their caterpillar phase. Um, if it kills the good uh, insects as well as the bad ones, that is potentially a reason not to spray all crops with this to kill caterpillar stage agricultural pests. Choice C sounds good. Let's check D. Since caterpillars of different species emerge at different times, several sprayings would be necessary. Uh, this one's kind. This one's a variation on the time trap. Um, just because you have to apply it more times doesn't mean it wouldn't work as advertised. Uh, it's just we would have to do it. We, you know, like I'm in the agricultural industry. Uh, we we would have to apply this uh, more times for for it to work. But it would still work. So the fact that it has to have multiple applications is. Um, outside the scope of the argument, the question is, why wouldn't we want to do it at all? And choice D doesn't answer that. E, although the enzyme has been synthesized in the laboratory, no large-scale production facilities exist as yet. It's another variation on time. Well, it's not ready yet. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's ready. The question is, why wouldn't we want to do it at all? And it not being ready yet is not a reason for that. So E is not it. Choice C, clearly by uh, killing beneficial agricultural bugs as well as um, these caterpillars that eat the crops, that's a reason not to kill all of them with this enzyme. Choice C is the correct answer. Still page 521, and but not still 116, because we weren't on 116 before. Firms adopting profit-related pay, or PRP, contracts pay wages at levels that vary with the firm's profits. In the metalworking industry last year, firms with PRP contracts in place showed productivity per worker on average 13% higher than that of their competitors who used more traditional contracts. If on the basis of the evidence, whoops, didn't mean to mark that. If on the basis of the evidence above, it is argued that PRP contracts increase worker productivity, which of the following, if true, would most seriously weaken that argument? So the downside of these gift uh, CR questions where they give you the argument in the question is that, of course, there's that much more to read. Um, that's just the way it goes. You can't, get, you can't always get what you want. So the, um, again, we have evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. The conclusion is that um, PRP... contracts increase productivity. The evidence is that um, firms with PRP went up, uh, was it 13 percent? 13 percent. So uh, the assumption here is uh, since this is, a, this is a causal argument, you know that X causes Y, and we need to weaken it. Remember, there are shortcuts for this. And the assumption, you know, the assumption underlying it is that this causal argument is what's true. So the assumption is that PRP equals the increase. Okay. Um, so, so to weaken a causal argument, we say um, there are three ways to weaken a causal argument. One is to say that no, X doesn't really cause Y. We would say, well, in this other industry, um, the uh, plastic um, spoon industry, I just made that up, sorry, um, not the most thrilling example, but in the plastic spoon industry, they use PRP contracts, and it didn't increase productivity at all. So we would use a comparative, comparative evidence to say, no, no, uh, PRP doesn't really cause um, increases in productivity. Uh, the second way that we weaken a causal argument is to say, no, no, it's actually the other way around. Uh, increases in productivity bring about PRP contracts, which, uh, unless you really want to come up with an elaborate backstory about how the workers say, well, hey, the company is making is producing more, we should share in the profits, and then they start negotiating uh, profit-related pay contracts, you know, anyway, that one's not going to be the reason in this particular case. The third way that uh, you, you weaken a causal argument is to say, no, 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 it's not X that causes Y, it's not uh, PRP contracts that cause the increase in productivity, it's some other thing that caused the increase in productivity. So, in the answer choices, we're going to be looking for something that says, 
okay, either PRP didn't increase productivity somewhere else or something else increased productivity in the metalworking industry in this time period, okay? And again, in real life, on the real GMAT, you aren't going to have to write all that out and listen to somebody tell you about it. You just remember these three ways to weaken a causal argument and um, you just look forward to the answer choices and it's a huge shortcut. You don't even have to do this step of you know evidence plus assumption equals conclusion causal argument go right to these and find one of these in the answer choices huge time it's my it's my favorite shortcut I love it so much I don't hesitate to mention it in every broadcast okay so we need either number one or number three uh, a results similar to those cited for the metalworking industry have been found in other industries where PRP contracts are used this actually strengthens the argument that it's PRP had this been um, the reverse had it said results similar results uh, similar to those cited for the metalworking industries have never been found in 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 other industries where PR, PRP contracts are used that would have been number one on our list but it doesn't say that so it's not a uh, choice B under PRP contracts costs other than labor costs such as plant machinery and energy make up an increased proportion of the total cost of each unit of output well you know uh, the fact that it's a bigger proportion of the cost per unit of output, I mean, I don't know, who cares? That certainly isn't a something that says that PRP isn't the cause of the productivity increase or that something else is. Uh, choice C, because introducing PRP contracts greatly changes individual workers' relationships to the firm, negotiating the introduction of PRP contracts is complex and time-consuming. There's our time trap. Um, Oh, it takes more time, but that doesn't tell us that PRP isn't the cause, nor does it give another cause for the increase in productivity. Uh, choice D, many firms in the metalworking industry have modernized production equipment in the last five years, and most of these introduced PRP contracts at the same time. Modernized production equipment could be the increase in productivity, so that's actually number three on our list, and so that makes it a keeper in, our, in my figuring. Uh, choice E, in firms in the metalworking industry where PRP contracts are in place, the average take-home pay is 15% higher than it is in those firms where workers have more traditional contracts. Higher take-home pay would imply a stronger incentive for the workers. If anything, this strengthens the arguments, argument rather than weakening it. So choice E is not it. Choice D gives us uh, a good reason, modernized production equipment, uh, that would explain the increase in productivity not related to PRP contracts. So D it is for 116. Last one on page 521, number 117. Scientists typically do their most creative work before the age of 40. It is commonly thought that this happens because aging by itself brings about a loss of creative capacity. However, studies show that of scientists who produce highly creative work beyond the age of 40, a disproportionately large number entered their field at an older age than usual. Since by the age of 40, the large majority of scientists have been working in their field for at least 15 years, the study's findings strongly suggest that the real reason why scientists over 40 rarely produce highly creative work is not that they have aged, but rather that scientists over 40 have generally spent too long in their field. In the argument given, the two portions in boldface play which of the following roles. So let's look at that. And one of the things you can also do um, is not just identify what part the boldface parts are, but identify all the parts. So we have um, we have a not bold section, and then we have a bold section, and then we have uh, another not bold section, and then we have another bold one. So you know sometimes you can actually kind of figure them all out, and sometimes that helps. I, I'm not saying that it's particularly helpful on this one, I'm just giving you an alternate strategy that for some of you may all of a sudden may, may make the light bulb go on and make this question type easier for you. That's part of, so that there is that kind of <laughs> throw everything at the wall and see what sticks approach to these broadcasts. Not everything that I do is necessarily going to be useful for you. Uh, some of these strategies really do depend on your specific frame of mind, your background, um, there is no one true strategy, if you've been doing any looking at all into uh, the GMAT, there is no one true strategy that works for everybody. Um, 
there are some strategies that work for large numbers of people, and then there are some other kind of edge strategies that work for smaller numbers. Um, right. So basically, you are not obligated to use this, but if you find yourself struggling with boldface passages, this is one thing to try. Um, anyway, so the first part, uh, it is commonly thought, uh, so scientific, scientific, scientists typically do their most creative work before the age of 40. That's some kind of evidence. And then we have, uh, it's thought that this happens because aging itself brings about, um, so we have a fact, and then we have a conclusion. And the conclusion is that scientists um, have lost their, create, their, their creative capacity. We know, because we already read it, that this is a conclusion that the argument, um, that the passage as a whole, gives an alternate explanation to. The bold face um, is then evidence that's used to support the conclusion that it's not just loss of creative power. Um, the not bold section um, provides some additional evidence backing that up. Um, you know, that scientists have been working, scientists over 40 have been working uh, uh, for 15 years in their field. And then the final bold thing is that, um, is the alternate conclusion for why scientists over 40 um, produce less. So, um, so, those, that's the breakdown of the entire passage. Um, and so this one was evidence for this one. This one was evidence for that one. And there we have it. Let's look for an answer choice that correctly identifies what the boldface parts are. Choice A, the first is a claim, the accuracy of which is at issue in the argument. So the bold one was evidence supporting the conclusion that was at issue. It is not itself a claim, the accuracy of which I mean, so we can already eliminate choice A just based on the first half. These need to be both pluses for it to be the right answer. We already know it's not it, so we could just stop there. But let's see what the second one is just to see how they're constructing their wrong answer choices. Uh, the second is a conclusion drawn on the basis of that claim. So basically, no, the, the second one is not this, this conclusion here. So we care about uh, these two sections. The second bold face one is not a conclusion drawn on the basis of the first bold one. That evidence, the first bold one, bold number one and two. So number two is not a conclusion based on number one. Uh, number two is, is the on, based on the stuff that came right before it. So doubly wrong for answer choice A. Choice B, uh, the first is, a, is an objection that has been raised against a position defended in the argument. Uh, no, it's not an objection, so we already know B's not it. Um, and B, the second part, the second is that position. Well, it's not a position defended in the argument. It's a position mentioned in the argument. So, I don't know, the second half is sort of okay, but it's already wrong. So, we don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, C, the first is evidence that has been used to support an explanation that the argument challenges. So, that's actually true. Uh, it, the, the first boldface thing is evidence that has been used to support an explanation that the argument challenges, namely that it's because aging brings about a loss of creativity, so that's good. Uh, the second is that explanation. No. Uh, the second boldface, green number two here, is the conclusion that the argument actually supports. So it's not C. Uh, D. Um, the first is evidence that has been used to support an explanation that the argument challenges. Yep, it is. Uh, the second is a competing explanation that the argument favors. Wait a minute. Do I have that wrong? Evidence that has been used to support um, an explanation that the argument challenges. Yeah, that sounds... Oh, actually, uh, no. The first, I actually drew my arrows wrong. I'm sorry. Um, the, <laughs> that, that explains why I got confused there. Um, the evidence actually is, whoops, is actually, uh, the first bold face is, is partially evidence that's used to support, to support the second one. Um, so, I'm sorry, the first part, this one's not right, this one's not right. Like, wait a minute, really? Because that sounds right. Uh, but no, uh, choice D, uh, the evidence, uh, the first bold face is, um, Additional evidence to, forget that, 
uh, to support the idea that it's uh, not lack of creativity, but that they entered the field um, earlier. So it's not used to support an argument that the argument challenges. Um, the second is competing explanation that the argument favors. It is that. Um, so it's not D. Choice E, the first provides evidence to support an explanation that the argument favors. Yes, it does that. Um, and the second is that explanation. Yes, that. So choice E is the correct one. Sorry about that. I drew my arrow my ro the wrong way and I relied too much on my um, diagram. So I guess I just illustrated the pitfalls of um, relying too much on your diagram as opposed to uh, double checking your work. And I guess actually that I just illustrated what you would do if, if all of a sudden, because um, then we would have gotten to E also and realized that it looked pretty tempting and then we would have had to compare the two and we would have gone back and looked at the actual passage, which is what I was doing just faster than I was verbalizing. And um, yes, anyway, choice E is the correct one. And now we get to turn the page to 522, number 118. Northern Air has dozens of flights daily into and out of Belleville Airport, which is highly congested. Northern Air depends for its success on economy and quick turnaround and consequently is planning to replace its large planes with Skybuses, whose novel aerodynamic design is extremely fuel efficient. The Skybus's fuel efficiency results in both lower fuel costs and reduced time spent refueling. Which of the following, if true, could present the most serious disadvantage for Northern Air in replacing their large planes with Skybuses? Okay. So they rely, the Northern Air, um, their, their success depends on economy and quick turnaround. And the Skybus um, is fuel efficient. It is, um, so it has a uh, lower fuel cost, and um, reduced fueling time. So even though, uh, and you may have seen that in the past I've pointed out time and money as uh, wrong answer choice traps, um, in this one the, the passage is all about time and money. So money, here's our money thing, and time. So to weaken the plan that uh, sky buses are going to help them, we need to basically either need to attack the economy of them or the turnaround time. One of those two, some aspect of air buses, if true, um, would be a serious disadvantage, and it's going to be either the money factor or the time factor. Let's look for it. Uh, a, the sky bus would enable Northern Air to schedule direct flights to destinations that currently require stops for refueling. That actually would strengthen the argument. That adds to the quick turnaround. You know, they're, they're spending less time on the ground refueling and they're just going directly to places. So it's not A. Uh, choice B, aviation fuel is projected to decline in price over the next several years. Um, this one's kind of the same, uh, whether they adopt these air buses or not, uh, or excuse me, sky buses. Um, so whether they adopt sky buses or not, if airline, if jet fuel goes down in price, uh, they will save money either way. So it's kind of neutral, therefore it doesn't weaken the argument. Choice C, the fuel efficiency of the sky bus would enable Northern Air to eliminate refueling at some of its destinations, but several mechanics would lose their jobs. Um, unfortunate, but this actually still strengthens it. If they are paying fewer um, people to refuel and, and maintain their planes and uh, eliminating uh, refueling at some of the stops, they're increasing time and money. So strengthening it again is not what we're after. Uh, D, none of Northern Air's competitors that use Belleville Airport are considering buying sky buses. That's sort of neutral and doesn't weaken the argument. We haven't had anything to weaken the economy or the turnaround time of, the, of Northern Air's sky buses. Choice E must be it, but let's look at how. Uh, choice E, the aerodynamic design of the sky bus causes turbulence behind it when taking off that forces other planes on the runway to delay their takeoffs. So on the assumption that Northern Air gets to have its planes take off in more or less the same you know, set of terminals and stuff, 
uh, the turbulence that it leaves behind affects the turnaround time if they have to wait to take off until the turbulence is passed. So uh, choice E weakened it on turnaround time, and choice E is the correct one. All right, still page 522, number 119. It is true of both men and women that those who marry as young adults live longer than those who never marry. This does not show that marriage causes people to live longer, since, as compared with other people of the same age, young adults who are about to get married have fewer of the unhealthy habits that can cause a person to have a shorter life, most notably smoking and immoderate drinking of alcohol. Which of the following, if true, most strengthens the argument above? So the argument that we need to, stre to strengthen is that it's Healthy living, must deny, not marriage, equals a longer life. So to strengthen that argument, we would either need to um, emphasize healthy living or um, weaken the idea that it's marriage. So these are the two attack points, or the two points, that, well, it's not really an attack point if we're strengthening it, but uh, we need to strengthen the argument so it's either going to be, yeah, no, it's really, it really is healthy living, or no, it's really not marriage. Let's look and see what we get. Choice A, marriage tends to cause people to engage less regularly in sports that involve risk of bodily harm. So this is a pro-marriage argument, and we need to weaken marriage. So this is, in fact, the the uh, the opposite of what we're after. Choice B, a married person who has an unhealthy bad habit, oh, I put bad in there, sorry. Uh, a married person who has an unhealthy habit is more likely to give up that habit than a person with the same habit who is unmarried. So this is another pro-marriage one. If you are going to get married and you give up drinking immoderately, um, that would be no, marriage would be the explanation for the longer life uh, rather than the healthier living per se. Uh, choice C, a person who smokes is much more likely than a non-smoker to marry a person who smokes at the time of marriage, and the same is true for people who drink alcohol immoderately. So all this says is that smokers marry each other and drinkers marry each other. Um, that doesn't strengthen our argument uh, at all, so, you know, eh, that doesn't do anything for us. A D, among people who marry as young adults, most of those who give up an unhealthy habit after marriage do not resume the habit later in life. Again, this is tying marriage, marriage as contributing to the cause rather than just healthy living per se. Um, and then E, among people who as young adults neither drink alcohol immoderately nor smoke, those who never marry live as long as those who marry. So this says that it's the healthy living which may come with marriage or not with marriage, that leads to a longer life, and marriage is basically um, an irrelevant variable. So choice E is our correct answer. Yeah. Okay, page 522, number 120. The earliest Mayan pottery found at Kola in Belize is about 3,000 years old. Recently, however, 4,500-year-old stone agricultural implements were unearthed at Kolha. These implements resemble Mayan stone implements of a much later period, also found at Kola. Moreover, the implements' designs are strikingly different from the designs of stone implements produced by other cultures known to have inhabited the area in prehistoric times. Therefore, there were surely Mayan settlements in Kola 4,500 years ago. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument above? So, um, evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. The conclusion is that um, those artifacts are Mayan artifacts. The evidence um, is that the The older things look like Mayan artifacts. 
Um, and so the assumption clearly is that if you look like something, you are something. Pretty straightforward. So if we need to undermine that conclusion, we need to say that just because they look like Mayan, they are not Mayan. Perhaps we would say that the same other culture gave that style to both the Mayans and that location. I don't know. Um, we'll have to see what the answer choices give us. A choice A, ceramic ware is not known to have been used by the Mayan people to make agricultural implements. Who cares about ceramics? Not I, not for the purpose of this question. Choice B, carbon dating of corn pollen in cola indicates that agriculture began there around 4,500 years ago. Well, there were agricultural tools dated to 4,500 years ago, so it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure that they must have had agriculture. So, I mean, you know, uh, um, that does not uh, weaken the argument by anyway. Um, Choice C, archaeological evidence indicates that some of the oldest stone implements found at Kola were used to cut away vegetation after controlled burning of trees to open areas of swampland for cultivation. Good story. Um, not at all relevant to weakening the idea that, um, that these old implements are in fact Mayan. In fact, I mean, we, we, we should expect basically that the word Mayan should appear in the correct answer in some context. Um, choice D, um, successor cultures at a given site often adopt the style of agricultural implements used by earlier inhabitants of the same site. So, um, successor cultures at a given site adopt the style of agricultural implements used by earlier inhabitants at the same site. So this is saying that the way these things look um, you know, from, from later, um, or, or from earlier, we, we, we're not actually sure what's going on here. It, it implies that there's more than one culture that lived there. So let's just keep D and, uh, see what happens. So then E, many religious and social institutions of the Mayan people who inhabited Kola 3000 years ago relied on a highly developed system of agricultural symbols. Well, we don't actually care about um, symbols per se. We care about agricultural tools. So choice E doesn't do it. So let's go back and look at D, which didn't look attractive at first. It didn't even have the word Mayan in it. So the argument is that um, they find Mayan pottery 3,000 years ago and 1,500 years uh, further in the past they find some uh, stone agricultural implements, and they look like Mayan stone implements of a much later period found there. Um, choice D says that successor cultures at a, at a given site often adopt the style of agricultural implements used by earlier inhabitants of the same site. So, um, basically, uh, we're, we're, we're saying that, there's a, that the connection between things looking Mayan and being Mayan is weakened, because uh, just because they look like they're Mayan doesn't mean that they are because people uh, change the, um, a second culture comes after the first one, they just make their agricultural tools look like the, pe look like the ones that, the, that the, the people had there before. So just because the older ones look Mayan doesn't mean that they are. Uh, so choice E, or excuse me, D, is the one that weakens the assumption that just because they look like they're from a certain culture doesn't mean they are because a subsequent culture may have just adopted um, the look of the tools. So uh, choice D is the correct answer. Page 523, number 121. Okay, Codex Berenensis, a Florentine copy of an ancient Roman medical treatise, is undated but contains clues to when it was produced. Its first 80 pages are by a single copyist, but the remaining 20 pages are by three different copyists, which indicates some significant disruption. Since a, since a letter in handwriting identified as that of the fourth copyist mentions a plague that killed many people in Florence in 1148, Codex Berenensis was probably produced in that year. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the hypothesis that Codex Berenensis was produced in 1148? So the correct answer needs to tie as closely as possible 
Um, that evidence, basically the letter, um, to the year 1148. So this question is all about chronology, things that, uh, so yes, we, the correct answer needs to make that dating more likely. So A, other than Codex Berenensis, there are no known samples of the handwriting of the first three copyists. Well, there's nothing about timing at all in there, so knowing that they are, that we don't have any other handwriting samples is outside the scope of the passage. Uh, choice B, according to the account by the fourth copyist, the plague went on for 10 months. Length of the plague, not relevant unless, you know, the only plague that went on 10 months was in 1148, but the answer choice doesn't give us that, so um, kind of irrelevant. Choice C, a scribe would be able to copy a page of text the size and style of Codex Berenensis in a day. Well, th that actually just makes the story kind of weird. If the whole book would take a day to copy, and it took the last 20 pages three different people, uh, to, to finish out, that means they had some crazy disruption like at the end of one workday, which while it makes the whole thing uh, weirder, but it doesn't actually make it any clearer that it was done in 1148. So really this is kind of outside the scope of the passage. Uh, choice D, there was only one outbreak, outbreak of plague in Florence in the 1100s. So in an entire 100 year period, um, uh, there was only one plague. And so th since the letter mentions it, and the um, plague was in 1148, um, that increases the chances that there was not confusion with some other plague. Uh, it highlights the, the likelihood that this is the, the actual date that's needed. So we'll keep D. Uh, and then E, the number of pages in Codex Berenensis produced by a single scribe becomes smaller with each successive change of copyist. Well, it, that could well be true, but it doesn't make the dating any more uh, likely. So choice E, again, is another scope issue. So choice D uh, is the only one that gives us a reason to tie the Codex Berenensis to a particular date by saying, hey, there was this plague in 1148, and by the way, there were no other plagues that it could have been confused with. So that makes choice D, or it makes the, the dating of 1148 all the more likely. Choice D is our correct answer. So page 523, number 122. The spacing of the four holes on a fragment of a bone flute excavated at a Neanderthal campsite is just what is required to play the third through sixth notes of the diatonic scale, the seven note musical scale used in much of Western music since the Renaissance. Musicologists therefore hypothesize that the diatonic musical scale was developed and used thousands of years before it was adopted by Western musicians. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the hypothesis? Um, so the hypothesis is that this um, four hole flute is uh, part of a seven note scale. That's an R there. So we need to strengthen the idea that this four-hole flute is part of a seven-note scale. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do that, but um, maybe they find another flute that uh, has the same holes and then it has more. We, this is one where it's really kind of hard to predict the circumstances because, you know, we're talking about cavemen here. So um, let's see what the answer choices give us to strengthen the idea that that fragment of a flute um, was actually used for a seven note scale. Uh, so choice A, bone flutes were probably the only musical instruments made by Neanderthals. Nope, um, we, that doesn't get us tie us to the seven note scale. Uh, choice B, no musical instrument that is known to have used a diatonic scale is of an earlier date than the flute found at the Neanderthal campsite. Well, the absence of any other ones doing it um, earlier does not mean that this one is more or less likely to have been part of the using a diatonic scale. So just because there are no earlier ones doesn't mean that this is one itself, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. So um, no earlier is not relevant. Uh, C, the flute was made from a cave bear bone and the campsite at which the flute fragment was excavated was in a cave that also contained skeletal remains of cave bears. 
So this could be used to strengthen the argument that the cave bears made their own flutes out of their own legs. And as funny as flute playing bears is to me, I mean, it's kind of funny to imagine cave bears playing flutes. Um, that's really all the choice C strengthens. It says, hey, there were cave bears and cave bear bone flutes. Maybe they made it themselves, which is clearly not what we need to strengthen. Um, choice D, flutes are the simplest wind instrument that can be constructed to allow playing a diatonic scale. Um, it being the simplest one, you know, we aren't given anything about caveman technology here, so, um, you know, they may have been able to make more complicated musical instruments too that could play a diatonic scale. It being, the flute being the simplest one doesn't affect our argument. So that leaves us, you know, with choice D or choice E by process of elimination. How is choice E going to make it possible for this four hole flute fragment to be part of a seven note scale? E says, the cave bear leg bone used to make the Neanderthal flute would have been long enough to make a full uh, a flute capable of playing a complete diatonic scale. So this does strengthen the argument if the bone, have, if they had had the whole, flute, the whole flute made from a cave bear leg bone, if they had the whole thing, that would have been long enough. The um, holes, the finger holes would have been, there would have been enough room for all seven holes to be the appropriate distance to play the diatonic scale. So choice E does strengthen the idea that um, this could have actually been part of the diatonic scale or that the flute could have been used to play the diatonic scale because the leg bone would have been long enough. Choice E for number 122. Second to last one, page 523 still, number 123. Outsourcing is the practice of, of obtaining from an independent supplier a product or service that a company has previously provided for itself. Since a company's chief objective is to realize the highest possible year-end profits, any product or service that can be obtained from an independent supplier for less than it would cost the company to provide the product or service on its own should be outsourced. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument? So the goal, so because uh, the argument is they should outsource whenever possible to meet their goal. Their goal being um, highest possible profits. So to weaken the argument, um, the answer choice would lead them to not getting the highest possible profits. We just look for that in the answer choices. A, if a company decides to use independent suppliers for a product, it can generally exploit the vigorous competition arising from several firms that are interested in supplying that product. So if anything, this uh, strengthens the argument because it says, hey, the independent contractors, the independent suppliers are going to be competing on price, allowing the company that outsources to get even higher profits. So A is not it. B, successful outsourcing requires a company to provide its suppliers with information about its products and plans that can fall into the hands of its competitors and give them a business advantage. So if you give your competitors a business advantage, you actually may impact your, your profits. You may not have the highest possible products or highest po possible profits if your competitors um, know what you're going to do and can react accordingly or get your secret plans or product designs or whatever it is. So uh, B is pretty tempting, but let's keep going. C, certain tasks such as processing a company's payroll are commonly outsourced whereas others, such as handling the company's core businesses or core business, are not. So this creates you know, a false distinction between um, two different types of activities. If the goal is to have the highest possible profits and outsourcing does that, this does not impact the argument. Um, this would simply indicate that perhaps handling the company's core business does not increase the profits when outsourced. D, for a company to provide a product or service for itself as efficiently as an independent supplier can provide it, the managers involved need to be as expert in the area of that product or service as the people in charge of that product or service at an independent supplier are. If anything, this strengthens it. It says it's actually easier to hand something off to people who are more expert than you, and then they can do it more efficiently than for you to do it yourself. So that's actually, sorry, we need C to be eliminated, not kept open. D is definitely eliminated. And then E, when a company decides to use an independent supplier for a product or service, the independent supplier sometimes hires members of the company staff who formerly made the product or provided the service that the independent supplier now supplies. 
Um, hiring former employees does not impact your highest possible profits. They're, they're hiring people who don't work there anymore. So that's kind of irrelevant uh, that they hire your former employees. Which brings us back to B, um, giving away your information about products and plans, which can fall into the hands of your competitors if you lose uh, some of your uh, business edge, you know, if you lose if you lose some business advantages to your competitors, um, you can see a reduction in profits. So choice B, while m probably more of a stretch than some of the questions we've had before, still clearly is the only one that could have an impact on profits. So it is choice B for number 123. Last but not least, finish off critical reasoning with page 524. Question number 124. Museums that house Renaissance oil paintings typically store them in environments that are carefully kept within narrow margins of temperature and humidity to inhibit any deterioration. Laboratory tests have shown that the kind of oil paint used in these paintings actually adjusts to climatic changes quite well. Quite well. If, as some museum directors believe, paint is the most sensitive substance in these works, then by relaxing the standards for temperature and humidity control, museums can reduce energy costs without risking damage to these paintings. Museums would be rash to relax those standards, however, since results of preliminary tests indicate that, oh gosh, I don't actually know how this word is pronounced. Well, it's either going to be gesso or gesso. Hmm. I'll go with gesso. No, I'll go with gesso. Yeah, I'll go with gesso. Uh, my apologies to those artists out there who know how to pronounce it if I'm doing it wrong. Um, since, preliminary, since results of preliminary tests indicate that gesso, a compound routinely used by Renaissance artists to help paint adhere to the canvas, is unable to withstand significant variations in humidity. In the argument above, the two portions in boldface play which of the following roles. So, um, so the, first sec the first section that's not bold is um, evidence, basically. The section that is bold um, is, um, so paint is the most sensitive substance in these works, and we've already established via the evidence that uh, paint um, can adjust to climatic changes. Um, so paint. So the the first bold faced thing is kind of um, it's evidence because it's what some museum directors believe. Um, it's used to support the conclusion that they can um, reduce energy costs without risking damage to the paintings. So it's used to, for the second bold face, which is a conclusion that the passage disagrees with. namely that museums can reduce energy costs without risk. And then the final not bold part is um, evidence and the conclusion that the argument agrees with. So um, The evidence, the first bold point is evidence used to support the conclusion that the passage disagrees with, namely that since paint can adjust to temperature and humidity changes, um, they could uh, reduce their energy costs without risking damage. So that's our analysis. Let's look for that in the answer choices. We're after this one, number one, and this one, number two. So A, the first is an objection that has been raised against the position taken by the argument. Nope. Uh, the second is the position taken by the argument. No, it's the position that the argument disagrees with. Uh, B, the first is the position taken by the argument. Nope, it's evidence. Uh, the second is the position that the argument calls into question. Well, that's true. The second one is the argument that the passage calls into question. Uh, so that's half right, but it's still half wrong. C, the first is a judgment that has been offered in support of the position that the argument calls into question. Yes, evidence for the thing that, that, the, that the, argue, the thing disagrees with. Um, the second is the position that the argument calls into question. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was reading the wrong one. The first is a judgment that has been offered. I was reading choice D. The first is a judgment that has been offered in support of the position that the argument calls into question. That's true. The second is a circumstance on which that judgment is in part based. No, the second one is not a circumstance. It is that actual judgment. Uh, D, the first is a judgment that has been offered in support of the position that the argument calls into the question. It is. The second is that position. Yes, it is. It's totally going to be D. But let's look at E. The first is a claim that the argument calls into question. No. And the second is the position taken by the argument. Also not true. So E was definitely way off. So choice D clearly is the, is the one that um, shows that it's the evidence and then the claim or the position that the argument as a whole disagrees with. So uh, choice D is the correct answer. We are now done with critical reasoning. Next time we will pick up with sentence correction. And um, yeah, so that's the last section in the official guide to the test in the 12th edition. So um, hope to see you next time.